Good evening, it's June 16th, and welcome to Cape Media News, your source for hyperlocal news that matters. I'm Lauren Williamson. The Arts and Justice Collective is hosting a unique event titled Saddle Up for Juneteenth, a queer cowboy celebration, on Monday, June 19th, from 1 to 3 p.m. at Asselton Park, Hyannis. The innovative celebration marks Juneteenth, Pride Month, and acknowledges the intersectionality of black and queer identities. The afternoon will be filled with live music, games, face painting, and even a drag show starting at 2 p.m. Participants are invited to wear their best Western attire to express their pride. The collective, which includes Amplify POC, Belonging Books, Cape Cod Voices, and Core July, aims to foster the sense of belonging for historically excluded groups through art and social justice. This exciting and inclusive event is free and open to the public. Scam warning, the Barnstable County Sheriff's Office has become aware that its name and names of actual Sheriff's Office employees are being used in an effort to fraudulently impersonate the Sheriff's Office. Do not give out any personal information to this caller. Mark your calendars as the Barnstable Land Trust celebrates both the Summer Solstice and National Pollinator Week with an array of exciting free events. On Wednesday, June 21st, bring your own flower pot to BLT's interactive flower pot music concert at Ropes Field in Katuit, where guests can also partake in pollinator-themed arts and crafts activities. The fun begins at 5.30 p.m. with the concert rehearsals starting approximately at 6.30 p.m. under the direct guest of conductor Sue D'Ambrosio from Cape Symphony. Additional events throughout the week include a Bees as Pollinators program, a piping plover walk at Sandy Neck Beach, and a tech-infused hike on the Barnstable Trails. Visit blt.org for more details on how you can join the celebrations, rain or shine. Attention all dentists, food service workers, living or working in the area. The Dennis Health Department, in conjunction with the Cape Cod Medical Reserve Corps, is offering a free life-saving choke saver class. The event will take place at the Dennis Police Department training room on June 21st, 2023, starting at approximately 10 a.m. and is ex expected to last about an hour. Seating is limited, so interested parties are encouraged to sign up as soon as possible by calling the health department. Don't forget to provide your name, phone number, and email address to take advantage of this opportunity for those in the food service industry to gain essential knowledge and skills. In a tragic turn of events in Barnstable, a motorcyclist who fled from the police died after crashing into a vehicle on Beers' Way near Enterprise Road. The incident began when a Barnstable police officer tried to pull the motorcyclist over for a failed traffic violation. But the rider failed to stop and subsequently collided with another vehicle. The individual was transported to Cape Cod Hospital, but was later pronounced dead. The driver of the other vehicle sustained minor injuries. Investigations into the crash are underway by the Cape Cod Regional Law Enforcement Council Crash Reconstruction Team. And identities remain undisclosed at this time. In an unusual rescue mission this week, retired Dennis firefighter Carl Jacobs, together with the Harwich Highway Department, managed to find a new home for some orphaned osprey chicks. The chicks were fostered by Wild Care Cape Cod after being found in a chimney nest. After much searching, a suitable new nest was located at Bud's Go-Karts track on Sisson Road. A joint effort by the Harwich Fire and Highway Departments ensured the chicks were safely moved using a construction lift, as the fire ladder couldn't fit through the track gate. It's been reported that the chicks are setting in well and adapting to their new family. The Cape Cod Gateway Airport is inviting the public to a meeting discussing the environmental review for ongoing and upcoming airport improvement projects. The meeting is set for Wednesday, June 21st, with two sessions, one online via Zoom at 2 p.m. and another in person at Barnstable Town Hall at 6 p.m. The discussion will offer updates on environmental review phases of the 2022 master plan projects, and attendees will have the opportunity to voice their comments or concerns. For more details or accommodation requests, visit the project's website. All are welcome, and especially local residents and business owners. For Hyannis residents, the deadline to sign up for the Massachusetts PFAS and Your Health Study has been extended until September 30th, 2023. 
This important study, funded by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, is aimed at understanding the potential health impacts of PFAS contaminants in drinking water, particularly in the areas like Cape Cod, where past exposure levels were alarmingly high. The study is free for residents who lived in Hyannis between May 2006 and July 2016, a period when the levels of PFAS in the local water system were higher than 99% of other public water supplies in the U.S. Although tap water is now being filtered to remove these harmful chemicals, the researchers are concerned about the possible long-term health effects from past exposures. Participants in the study will be asked to provide blood and urine samples, body measurements, and to complete a questionnaire. In return, they will receive a report with their results and advice on how to reduce their exposure to PFAS. If you are interested in participating or learning more about the study, please contact the team at pfas-health-study at silentspring.org or by phone or text at 508-296-4298. This study offers a unique opportunity for Hyannis residents to contribute a scientific understanding of PFAS while gaining personal insights to their health. The town of Yarmouth is taking steps to increase availability of smaller rental units in residential areas with a new proposed bylaw. The aim is to address the demand for year-round rental housing while preserving the town's character and minimizing environmental impact. The proposed bylaw seeks to provide a wider range of housing options, optimize existing housing resources, and support a diverse year-round community. The size of accessory apartments will be limited with a maximum of two bedrooms and specific floor plan area limitations based on the size of the primary dwelling. The proposed bylaw introduces a permit procedure that requires a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals for all accessory apartment uses. Property owners will be required to fill annual affidavits disclosing the use of principal dwelling and accessory apartment, including lease agreements. The proposed bylaw is still in the review and consideration stage before potential implementation. Please note that the document is a draft and is subject to change. The Yarmouth Planning Board will have two more listening sessions this month, highlighting the proposed bylaw on June 14th at 6 p.m., at the Yarmouth Senior Center, 528 Forest Road, West Yarmouth, and on June 26th at 6 p.m. at the Yarmouth Fire Station, number two. 340 Route 6A, Yarmouthport. Coming up after the break, Cape Cod Nordic Walking Club and more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Cape Media News. I'm Lauren Williamson. Last Sunday was an incredible day filled with excitement, competition, and unity as the Massachusetts Military Support Foundation organized the Fishing for Vets event on Cape Cod Bay. Take a look. Present arms. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Last Sunday, veterans from across the country gathered at Sasuit Harbor, ready to embark on a memorable day of fishing activities. With the support of the Massachusetts Military Support Foundation, these brave men and women teamed up with all USA veteran crews to participate in the third annual Fishing for Vets tournament. Generous charter boat captains donated their time, expertise, and vessels to lead the veteran teams in this exciting tournament. Their commitment and generosity were greatly appreciated by all of the participants. As the boats sailed into the calm waters of Cape Cod Bay, the veterans had the chance to reconnect with nature and connect with one another. But fishing lines were cast and the competition was soon on. Lift the rod up, lift it up. Oh, right there. Woo! My oh, granddaughter beautiful. wants fish. Oh, that's a big one. My granddaughter wants fish, guys. With each catch, the excitement grew, and stories were shared throughout the day. The Fishing for Vets event not only provided a thrilling fishing experience, but it also served as a reminder of the unwavering support and gratitude for the sacrifices made by our veterans. When the event ended, 
the veterans departed with new memories, new friendships, and a renewed spirit. The Massachusetts Military Support Foundation, along with its sponsors and dedicated captains, succeeded in creating a truly unforgettable day for our deserving veterans. For Cape Media News, I'm Christian Garnett. A popular Facebook group met earlier this week to celebrate its one year anniversary, as well as announce the club's new nonprofit status. For more on this, here's Ryan Downs. This past week, the Cape Cod Nordic Walking Club celebrated its one year anniversary on Tuesday the 13th with a beach party at Sandy Neck in Barnstable. Founder Carla Fogren initially aimed to find a handful of like minded individuals to join her on Nordic Walks when she first created the Facebook group. However, the response exceeded all expectations, and the club now boasts 2,000 enthusiastic members. To mark its one-year anniversary, CCNW announces the club's exciting news of being granted 501c3 nonprofit status. This designation enables the CCNW to receive donations, grant funds, and offer tax-free proceeds from the sale of their poles and other merchandise. The nonprofit status ensures that membership can remain free, securing accessibility to a wide range of participants. There are 10 certified Nordic walking instructors and 28 walk hosts who organize close to 100 walks each month on Cape Cod. Membership is free, and after completing an instructional clinic, new members gain access to a variety of walks, varying lengths, locations, and difficulty levels through the club's Facebook page. Fogren credits the club's success to the dedication of the hosts, instructors, and the two administrators, Brenda Brown and Sue Moynihan. Cape Cod Nordic Walking has become a means for people to learn Nordic walking, explore Cape Cod's scenic trails, and forge lasting connections. As Fogren aptly puts it, with Cape Cod Nordic Walking, you will never have to go Nordic walking alone. Unless you want to, of course. From humble beginnings using improvised poles made from snow stakes and yarn straps, the Cape Cod Nordic Walking Club has come a long way. Today the club offers its members professional grade Nordic walking poles decorated with their logo. The charm of the club lies not only in the physical exercise it provides, but also in the strong sense of community it fosters. Fogren acknowledges that people initially join for the exercise, but stay for the camaraderie describing the power of the poles as incredible. To get in on all the action, join the Cape Cod Nordic Walking Group on Facebook and get started. For Cape Media News, I'm Ryan Downs. Last weekend, the Harwich Cultural Center came alive with laughter and excitement as the community gathered to celebrate a special occasion. News Director Mitch Sock brings you the highlights from the Children's Center 30th birthday celebration. The Children's Center 30th birthday celebration at Harwich Cultural Center was a day of fun and festivities for the whole family. And with free entry, there was something for everyone to enjoy. The Good Times ice cream truck delighted attendees with a delicious assortment of ice cream flavors and toppings, providing a sweet escape from the summer heat. Vintage car enthusiasts were treated to an impressive display of antique cars, while a fire truck captivated visitors, giving them a hands-on experience and a chance to learn about firefighting. The Harwich Police Department brought their Touch a Truck display, allowing children to explore police vehicles and learn about the vital role of law enforcement in our community. Monomoy Regional High School students showcased their artistic talents at the face painting station, transforming children's faces into colorful works of art. The 30th birthday celebration also featured exciting raffle prizes, including skate passes for Charles Moore Arena and gift cards to local restaurants and retailers, adding an extra element of anticipation and excitement. The Children's Center 30th birthday celebration brought the community together, creating lasting memories of laughter, creativity, and togetherness. It's events like these that truly showcase the spirit of Harwich. For Cape Media News, I'm Mitch Sock. Coming up after the break, a look inside the Dennis Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee's listening session. Welcome back to Cape Media News, I'm Lauren Williamson. The Town of Dennis Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee held a listening session last month to get feedback from residents on how they could better serve the community. Cape Media News was there to cover the event, and here are some highlights.
<laughs> Don't be shy. I mean, this is an opportunity for us to hear what you have to say. We're going to be the eyes and ears of the community. We need to know what the community wants. It's your town. It's our town. And it's time that we start looking at what we can do for each other. And by doing that, we want to include your thoughts. Okay, we're looking for people to join the organization, to join us, to be the eyes and the ears and the minds of other folk. You talk to people every day. Do they have concern? We have not had a person of color as a prosecutor since 1994. Oh. So it's been a, been a bit. Uh, one of the goals of the committee will certainly be recruitment. Uh, we have uh, extended certain efforts already to try to engage in recruiting. Uh, we've met some frustrations uh, with a few different law schools uh, and a college. Uh, so we are looking for all the help that we can possibly get. Uh, I feel welcome as a gay person, um, but I'm also a white person. <laughs> so uh, I don't feel that you know pressure all the time. And I wonder if in our town we feel like we have enough police officers, firefighters, other people uh, in positions of um, you know, municipal uh, positions like that. And so that's something that makes me a little uncomfortable being in Dennis. You know, I came, I lived uh, in Greater Boston, I lived in uh, Watertown, and you know, we had much more diversity and that's something that I miss down here in Dennis. I think to some degree this whole conversation starts with education. We all need to learn more about what our community really is about. And to be honest with you, as a white, old white guy, I be, it just seems like there's an awful lot of old white guys in the community, or old white couples. But the truth is, the more I look and the more I search, that's not really totally true. Our community is much more diverse than many of us, including me, realize. And we need to expose that to people like myself and everybody else in the community. And I think to some degree, this whole thing starts with how do we expose that? How do we bring out this diverse population, which really does exist here in the town of Dennis? Yeah. Caucasians, I think, find it very difficult to talk about race. And I think that's a phobia that they're going to have to overcome. Yeah. And we as black folk don't have a problem with that. I mean, we're, we're working 24-7. Okay, I can walk into the room and they automatically know or identify or pigeonhole me as a person of color. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn about each other. All right? And I would agree with Brad that it starts with education. Yeah. Right. I, I think we have to kind of take a stand yeah. because yeah. There, there are a whole bunch of people out there that want to tear everything down. Yeah, sure. And uh, they, if they weren't there, this committee might not be as needed as it is. It's even something at Town Hall, you know, Dennis believes in diversity. Dennis, you know, something more anodyne than, you know, specific things about specific flags like sure. Juneteenth, which is very important. Um, you know, maybe we can kind of get that movement going. And so, to your point, it becomes natural to be open to others. I, I have to say, from a personal point of view, <clears throat> because I'm transgender. Um, when I go dri driving down the road and I see something out in front of a church, I say, everyone welcome. Yeah, that's right. Sort of I know I'm not welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. yeah. Oh. For the town to say just some bland saying yeah, doesn't yeah. mean a heck of a lot to someone yeah. who's in an oppressed minority yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it just brings in, or it has a chance of bringing in a bigger part of the community Absolutely. than what we see at town meeting. Yeah. In fact, a different part of the community totally. Mm -hmm. And then once they're there, the, there's a chance to educate and go, hey, by the way, if this is important to you, you could join this committee. You could be in this room tonight and get some of that community to participate and become active mm -hmm. in the town which is where we need them to be. And I think even inviting them to one meeting, just a listening <laughs> session like this, a lot of people, a committee? What? You meet, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want to commit to that. Mm. But they might come out and, if you're touching on a particular topic at a meeting, 
to have people come out and sit in on that meeting for that purpose. That's a start. I totally understand the feeling of just not fitting in because I moved here in 2006 and I have taught myself that I belong in any room I walk in. But I had to teach myself that. I had to make that how I walk into a room because I just didn't feel comfortable. I had to force myself to feel comfortable to live here. Because I want to live here. I like living here. It's gorgeous. I, I really like the community. I just wish it were more open. And when I say more open, I just wish we could have like open conversations about race because black people in my family, we talk about race all the time. Like it's Tuesday, like it's mayonnaise, like it's ketchup, like it's, it's nothing to us, you know, because it, we live it. So if we can have these open conversations more, I think it'd be easier for people of color to feel more, you know, included, you know, and if we can have people be willing to talk about race honestly, honestly tell us what you think. And will it change? Hopefully, yes. But the only way it will is if we have these open conversations. Our church here has had an ongoing uh, conversation about racism and, oh, yeah. you know, and the problem with that is... It's all white people talking It's all together. white people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's still, it's a good, good thing for a bunch of white people to sit down and have uncomfortable conversations. Yes. Mm -hmm. And be comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's fine to be uncomfortable. You know, you learn something from it. Hopefully you teach somebody else something. Mm -hmm. And then you move on. And you, you know, you, you change and you make things better for the people who are here. For everybody, you know, to, to be more comfortable talking about race. I think this is really a part of it. Because, like, how do people talk about race? You know, yeah. race? And why is it such a big problem? Like, what is in the... The, the very soul of it, what, what is the real reason, you know, is it just because we don't understand it, is it because, what is it that makes us uncomfortable, what is it, because it shouldn't be. We were talking about education before in terms of all of this, we don't have a problem so much here. Uh, I still call this kind of my Cape Cod bubble, where I'm safe, mm -hmm. uh, but in the rest of the country things are terrible, mm -hmm. and I think there's always a need for education in terms of what's real and what's not. And to hear different people's stories, to know what they've gone through so that you can appreciate this. Um, for instance, you know, one the huge thing is trans girls in sports. And it's a front for trying to get rid of us. <laughs> it just is. The whole yeah. thing, it's... To start off, is totally wrong. But then they'll build on that, mm. and gosh, it makes sense. And oh, we shouldn't have those trans girls in sports. There's a lot of different levels of that that need to be talked about. But um, just I want to put that out there, and um, well, it's part of we'd be inclusion. It's in, yeah, absolutely, and. We're very, very fortunate, but that bubble is getting thinner and thinner. If you would like to see the full meeting, you can watch it on Channel 99 next week. Thank you for joining us this evening. If you have a story you'd like to see covered, send us an email at newstip at katemedia.org. Tune in next week for more hyper-local news that matters. On Channel 99, Apple TV, Roku, and Fire TV. For Cape Media News, I'm Lauren Williamson. See you next week.